Raven Ridge APUs are interesting as products. In a world where MSRP acted as an infallible decree handed down by galactic overlords, the GT 1030 would cost $70, the RX 560 would cost $100, and the G 4560 would have always been $60. In this world, the real one, the GT 1030 has now usurped both the GTX 1050 and RX 560 in price, landing at $110 to $120 for a really low-end graphics card, and the G4560 has actually fallen in price, oddly, down to 60 from an overpriced $80 previously. And then the R32200G and R52400G entered the market priced at $100 and $170 respectively. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake and the View 71 enclosure. The View 71 is a full tower case that's capable of fitting three video cards in most configurations. It's also one of the better cooling cases in our recent case testing bench lineup. The View 71 has hinged tempered glass doors on either side that make it easy to open and show off, and it comes with at least one rain fan, though you can get the RGB version if you prefer. Learn more at the link in the description below. To recap our previous coverage of Raven Ridge, basically we bought the APUs and we immediately did some DLID and extensive thermal coverage. If you want that, go check the previous videos. Today we're focusing only on gaming benchmarks. No power, no thermals, no nothing other than gaming. Because ultimately, APUs are meant to go on gaming machines that are low end. So APUs, the argument is that it is for price conscious users. This means that there's no room for the usual wishy-washy, this part's fine, except if you have $20 more, you can buy this one, or $20 less, you can buy this one. There's no room for that. You either buy it or you don't. Because when, it's, when it comes down to these cheap parts, the alternatives are a G4560 and a GT1030 for some price, uh, or an R3 and a GT1030, or something like that. So a GT1030 should be $70. It's presently, at time of filming, 110 to 115 which just really pains me because that's what the 1050 and the 560 were priced originally. But that's the world we live in. Uh, the, R, the G4560 was $80, it's now 60, and the R3 CPU is about $100. So ultimately you're looking at an R3 plus a GT1030, let's just pick that one for now because that's what we tested, those come out to about $200, kind of insane. A G4560 and a 1030, thanks to the new 4560 price reduction, comes out to about 170 to 200, depending on where and when you buy it. The R3 and R5 APUs are $100 and $170, which is what makes the argument sort of tempting and interesting, especially for the R3 2200G. We think that's the rock star that you should be looking to, because it's $70 cheaper than the R5, and it's pretty damn close to it in performance, as you'll see today. Uh, so, for that previous coverage, check the thermal content. Otherwise, today we're talking about overclocking and gaming performance, and we also previously talked about DRAM scalability, where we tested memory scaling for frequency, uh, for cache latency, and for channeling, and you can find that content elsewhere. But, uh, starting out, we did a lot of overclocking on these APUs. Please note that the gaming K5 gigabyte motherboard we used exhibited some variability in the base clock. So although we would set a multiplier of 39.5 or 39, we would often see clocks that were a bit lower than 3900 because the base clock would fluctuate uh, between basically 96 point something and 101, depending on how it felt. So what that means is that in the charts when you see 3.95 gigahertz, it's set to that, but it's possible that it was dithering between whatever 96 times 39.5 is versus 100 times 39.5. Let's just quickly put one of the memory tests on the screen from previously as well, just to recap everyone. We can do Firestrike or Time Spy or something like that. We saw some decent scalability on the APUs. Part of what we were testing was how do these perform with different kits of memory? And we can cycle through a few of the previous charts to show the differences. Ultimately what we found was that our Trident Z uh, 3200 megahertz CL14 kit seemed to play better with the motherboards we used, and we tested multiple of those, and the APUs. And uh, so that's what we're using for the main testing. And for the G4560, we're using 2400 megahertz RAM. You can learn more about why we made these choices in the test methodology section linked in the description below. Please click that link before you ask questions. It's probably answered there. So with all that said, 
Articles below if you need more info on previous content. Otherwise, let's get into the charted data for gaming today. Getting straight into the esports titles, we're starting on Overwatch at 1080p medium. As discussed in our previous bench theory test duration content, we run five minute test passes for Overwatch as its dynamic nature introduces a lot of variance. The five minute passes smooth this out. You can learn more about our Overwatch testing methodology over in the bench theory series previously. The GT 1030 results are close to margin of error of one another. There's some overlap, and so we can call the GT 1030 with the 4560 and 2400 MHz RAM as appreciably equal in performance to the overclocked R3 2933 MHz memory and GT 1030. The AMD R5 2400G overclocked to 3.95 GHz and 1600 MHz on the IGP performed respectively close to the discrete devices. The part lands at 60 FPS average, with lows similarly scaled to its competition. The APU ends up within margin of error of the GT1030 and 3.9 GHz R3 1200, with the G4560 and 1030 running a couple percentage points ahead. Stock the R5 2400G with 3200 MHz CL14 RAM performs at 54 FPS average, resulting in its overclock granting a 12% jump over the stock APU. Stock the 2400G doesn't impress in this game, but its overclock changes the stack significantly. The R3 2200G operates at 50 FPS stock, with the 2400G leading by about 7%. For a $70 price increase, that's not a big jump in performance. Our 2200G overclocked the IGP a bit higher than our 2400G and ended up at 55.5 FPS average. It seems that there's some inherent advantage to the 2400G over the 2200G for Overwatch. It's just a question of whether that's worth $70 to you for an extra couple percentage points of performance, and that depends on how much you care about this one game. Rocket League has the discrete parts placing in the top of the chart, plotting within margin of error of one another. This is an instance where we've become bound by the GT1030 and not by their partnered CPUs, and illustrates why we eliminate bottlenecks in discrete component reviews. This, however, is not one of those. Integrated GPU testing requires a more value-driven method rather than a perfectly clean test method. The R5 2400G lands at around 61 FPS average when overclocked, placing its average FPS within our error margins for the top two discrete results. These are functionally equivalent in average frame rate. They are not equivalent in lows, however. We noticed that the APU underperformed in 0.1% low metrics, something we can better show with this frame time plot. The harder stutters are rare, fortunately, but they do occasionally pop up and get noticed. Overall, the R5 2400G is doing well to keep up with two dedicated processing components, but the two discrete components are still doing a bit better. Back to the chart, the R3 2200G stock APU places at about 54 FPS average, led by the stock 2400G by about 7.5%. Once again, for a $70 difference, this gap doesn't seem worth the jump. Even low-end frame time performance isn't all that disparate between the two APUs. Overclocking the 2200G pushed it to 60 FPS average, impressively within standard deviation of discrete component performance, and highlighting again that the 2200G is really the part to look at here. Again, the low-end frame time performance here isn't impressive, not in this game. But for a $100 part, we do have to remark again that this is hands down very impressive. APUs in the past, things more similar to this one, for example, have not done too well. It's basically always come down to a really wishy-washy, like, well, you could use it in this specific HTPC build, I guess. But ultimately, a lot of the time you could buy a discrete component when the whole shortage thing didn't exist, and a cheap CPU, and you'd get better performance for gaming. That's changed. Ryzen and Vega together have really done a lot for the APU discussion for AMD. The 2400G, however, really struggles to look valuable in the face of its own alternative, the 2200G, its brother, basically. So uh, in this testing so far, and we haven't gone through all of it, the $100 2200G looks really damn good because it's $100. And a GT1030 with a G4560, which is also incredibly impressive in performance for the price, it doesn't come close in terms of price to performance, even though the 2200G is a bit behind in some scenarios, you can always drop settings a little bit to recover some of those frame time differences. So uh, quite a good show so far, but we have a couple more charts to go through. Let's move on to Sniper Elite 4. This game is sort of a best case for AMD hardware, whereas something like Source Engine games can be more of a worst case. 
Sniper Elite's asynchronous compute and proper DX12 implementation are well leveraged on the APU. First, note that this is 1080p high. The settings are aggressive for an APU, and you should drop to lower settings if you're actually going to play this game. The point, however, is to use the higher settings because we already have a lot of GPUs tested with this game, so we have some extra data we can show. Treat this more like a synthetic test, though know that the scaling is linear as settings are reduced, so it all scales relatively equally anyway. We just like this for DGPU data. One more note, the DGPUs, if not otherwise listed, were tested on our 7700K GPU test platform, so you get an unrestrained look at lower end GPU performance, but not an equivalent look in terms of price. Obviously, we still have the GT1030 and the cheap CPU for that. The R5 2400G experiences a 10% uplift when overclocked from baseline. The GT1030 and 4560, using the slower memory, mind you, at 2400 MHz, end up with a stock R5 leading by a noteworthy 17%. The overclocked R5 leads the GT1030 and 4560 by 29%, with, again, no overclocking on the 1030, and none can be done on the 4560. The 2400G does well in this game, and would clearly be the better option to the GT1030 and 4560. We don't have data on this one for the 2200G, though. Our Civilization 6 benchmarks use turn time as a metric for performance rather than frames per second. This is for a few reasons, one of which is that FPS analysis during Civ is largely irrelevant, and the other is that it can often be invalid. The longer a processor takes to complete a turn, the higher its frame rate. In other words, slower processors perform better in FPS value, depending on how you test, which is because they spend more time staring at an unchanging screen to process the turn. Because this doesn't rely upon GPUs for testing, we can show all other CPUs we've tested lately. Any CPU with unspecified memory speeds is running at 3200 MHz. In our testing, we found the overclocked R5 2400G to perform roughly equivalently to the R5 1600X in turn time processing, landing at about 19 to 20 seconds per turn. For five players, it would take about 1.6 minutes to complete a full round until your next turn. Stock, the 2400G completes its turns approximately two seconds slower than overclocked, granting the overclocked 2400G a 9% turn time reduction. The overclocked 2200G completes its turns in about 24.7 seconds, with the stock 2200G distant from the pack, down at 27.5 seconds. The stock 2400G does hold a meaningful time reduction of 22% over the stock 2200G, and the overclocked variants put the 2400G as 21% reduced. We haven't yet run the G4560 in this bench, but the R3-1300X runs between the stock and overclocked R5-2400G CPU entries. CSGO was one of the more sensitive games to memory changes, as we discussed previously. We're still using the Trident Z kit as our baseline, as it works the best with the gaming K5 and the APUs. The R5-2400G stock CPU performs at 95 FPS average, with lows reasonably in lockstep. The R3-2200G operates at 86 FPS average, permitting the 2400G a lead of 10.5%. The discrete components land between 111 and 120 FPS average, which is a substantial lead over the overclocked and similarly priced, between $0 and $20 different, R5-2400G. The R3-2200G is the real winner here. At $100, it's providing 83% of maximum performance, as rated relatively versus the chart-topping combo. To achieve 83% of performance at 58% of price, plus or minus the impact of $10, is pretty damn impressive. Granted, this is after we overclocked the R3 APU, but overclocking is not particularly hard on these CPUs anyway. Ryzen Master makes it more accessible than before, despite a preference for BIOS overclocking. For this title specifically, we'd recommend either the 2200G for something ultra cheap, or the discrete component combination. The R5-2400G has limited usefulness in its price bracket for this particular title. Dota 2 will likely mirror CSGO, given the same roots, but let's take a look. We've become GPU-bound in Dota 2, with the G4560 and overclocked R3-1200 both maintaining 63 FPS average. Either would be a suitable choice for our settings. The R3-2200G with a 1650 MHz GPU overclock roughly ties the overclocked R5-2400G, both at 50 to 51 FPS average. The 2400G does manage to maintain advantaged 1% low frame times though. Stock, the 2400G holds a 45 FPS average, with the stock 2200G not meaningfully different. It would seem that we are bound elsewhere in the stack. Total Warhammer at 1080p medium places the overclocked APUs in commanding positions, managing to take the top two slots with the IGP overclock. The R3-1200 and GT-1030 follow in third, with the R3-2200G outperforming this discrete combo by roughly 6%. 
The R5 leads the R3 by about 10% thanks to the game's actual utilization of additional resources. As for stock, the APU is run behind its discrete components. Our R5 2400G stock APU operated at 35 FPS average with overclocking the 2400G granting a significant 20-ish percent uplift. We also have some 1080p high results and Ghost Recon results for scaling performance in the written review linked below. So that recaps the performance. A couple things here. As always, if you're new, with any kind of game benchmarking, we can only speak to two things. The games we tested and the games related to the games we tested. That's why we choose a smaller suite of games that uses known engines, ideally something a little bit different for each one while still being popularly played titles. So, with the games we've tested, and ignoring all other factors, focusing strictly on gaming performance. What we're in is a situation where if you're buying a $100 to $170 product, you probably don't care about things like necessarily power consumption or thermals, although we covered that extensively and they're fine, uh, or things like that. What you care about is gaming performance for the dollar. For the dollar, the APU that hands down gets our recommendation if you're really struggling to piece something together would be the R3 2200G. You have a lot fewer expansion options going forward with an R3 2200G. It's more limited on the CPU side. If your plan is to uh, fill what I would assume is a more limited use case, but one that is still somewhat common, if your plan is to fill the system with a DGPU later, a discrete card, and upgrade and keep the other thing as a CPU, then you're going to be more limited with a 2200G. That's just how it's going to be. So if that's your use case, ignore the recommendation. But if it's not, if you're just trying to build something cheap that games pretty well, we like the 2200G a lot. At $100, it's really good value. It's within single digit percentage points in most cases of the 2400G. And it's behind, yes, the discrete components, but it's $100. And the 4560 with the GT1030, which we also really like, by the way, those two parts are closer to 170 on a good day plus or minus a bit. So either way you look at it, you're at least $70 cheaper with the 2200G. Now, of course, you would want to go with faster memory. We did some memory frequency and kit scaling in a previous content piece. If you're curious about the impact of 2400, 2933, 3200, whatever, check the content. We'll tell you there how much it matters to buy the kits. I believe our conclusion was something along the lines of 2933 is perfectly fine. It's not a huge performance disparity. If you can save another $10 there, or what it depends on your region, then do it. Because ultimately, if you're buying a $100 part, saying, well, but going up to $3,200 from $2,933 is only $13 more. No, stop it. <laughs> no, <laughs> like bad. Because when you're doing that game, when you're saying it's only $13 more, that's a 13% increase on what you're spending on the APU. When you're spending that much more money, you're getting close to just doing either the higher end APU and then still spending $13 more uh, or doing discrete components. Because if you buy a 2400G at $170 or whatever it is, uh, and you're spending an extra couple bucks to go from 2933 to 3200, depending on your region and where you live, then you're entering territory where the price is now at equivalence with the discrete components and 2400 megahertz of RAM. So consider that, keep that in mind. That's why uh, the 2400G doesn't impress enough, frequently enough in these titles, mind you, uh, to really get an outright recommendation. It's fine, but it, there's nothing special about it. The 2200G is quite special in that it's very affordable. It's surprising how well it performs with reasonably high settings and you can stick 2933 megahertz of memory in there and be quite happy with it. Uh, in the US, the memory prices aren't as disparate as in other regions. We've looked, sometimes going from 2933 or 2666 to 3200 can be a big jump. So uh, you don't necessarily lose a lot by going with slightly slower memory. It's not as crazy needed as just going with two sticks of it. That's important, but the couple hundred megahertz jump, uh, not quite as much. And if you're value driven, then keep the value in mind. Spend the money on something else that's also important for your system, like cooling or whatever it may be. Uh, so yeah, recapping this briefly, from the games we've tested, we quite like the 2200G. The 2400G, we don't really feel like there's a good spot for it uh, that's as clear of a standout 
like screaming buy me spot in the market. It's one of those things you look at and more or less weigh the options at the time. What is the discrete combination cost? What is the 2400G cost? It might be better to buy the discrete combination. In a lot of these tests, the GT1030 and an R3 or a G4560 and the, the latter being more comparable in price were decently better than the 2400G uh, Sniper notwithstanding, and games like Sniper. Doom would likely be factored in, Wolfenstein would likely be factored in. So those games notwithstanding, if you're looking at esports titles and you're trying to spend about 200 bucks, the discrete combination still looks better, but if you're trying to spend less, we do like the 2200G is worth buying. So those would be my two choices. Based on the data we've collected, it's 2200G and cheap discrete combo, not a lot of space for the 2400G until its price drops, and it will. It'll eventually come down. Once it's 150, that'll be a really compelling argument. But at 170, not quite so much. So uh, that's it for now. If you want to see more information, check the article linked in the description below, where we'll have additional charts and information on all of this. Subscribe for more as always. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our mod mats. They will be shipping the end of this month or early next month, most likely, uh, and that's our next round. So thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.